In section 2.4, we're going to talk about um, the symbolizing the composition of molecules using molecular formulas and empirical formulas. And then we'll um, talk about how to represent the bonding arrangements of atoms within molecules. Okay, so the first thing here is we have our molecular formula. This is a representation of a molecular compound which consists of the following. We're going to have the chemical symbols from the periodic table we talked about before. Then we're going to have subscripts after the symbols to indicate the number of each type of atom in the molecule. Um, so in the subscripts are usually omitted, like we don't put one in there as a subscript. Um, those are usually omitted and we assume that there's only one of them. Um, the second part is a structural formula. And this actually shows the bonds that are formed and how it's actually arranged. Let's see some examples of that. So here we have our molecular formula. We just have our chemical symbols, and we know that there are four hydrogens for every one carbon in this guy. Here we can see that carbon is the central atom. It's making four bonds to each of these hydrogens. Here we can rep see this represented in 3D with um, actual sticks representing the bonds. And then here we have this space filling one um, that kind of shows that those bonds are actually due to the overlap of the atomic uh, radii. You're going to see a lot of chemistry represented in this form if you continue to go on into organic chemistry. Um, so many elements consist of discrete little individual atoms, but some of them like to form more complex structures. So a lot of the classic ones are diatomic. So you, you're rarely ever going to find a loose hydrogen atom. You're always going to find H2, N2, O2, F2, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. These guys are always going to want to find another um, element uh, nearby, another atom friend, and pair off. Um, sometimes it's even more complicated. The most common form of sulfur is actually S8, where it forms this uh, kind of twisted ring structure. Here's an example of what the difference is in really the subtle ways that we write things. So if I wrote just a capital H, I would mean one hydrogen atom. If I put a 2 in front of it, I would mean two individual hydrogen atoms. When the two is a subscript after that H, I mean two hydrogen atoms that are actually bonded together, forming one molecule. Putting a two in front of that with the subscripts means I have two hydrogen molecules for a total of four atoms. empirical versus molecular formula. So the empirical formula indicates the simplest whole number ratio of the number of atoms or ions in a compound, whereas a molecular formula indicates the actual numbers of atoms of each element in a molecule of the compound. Um, here's my example down here. If we have benzene, the molecular formula is going to show that every benzene molecule is made out of six carbon and six hydrogens. But to get the empirical formula, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find um, the least common multiple here of six, and I'm going to divide both of these by six, and I'm going to just get CH. Another example would be uh, acetic acid. Here's our molecular formula. You can see each one of these subscripts is divisible by two. If I do that, I get CH2O. Picturing benzene here for a second, we have this ring structure here, and we can see that the molecular formula indicates all the atoms that would be in this structure, whereas the empirical formula just represents this small piece that is the smallest repeating unit. You can see that the empirical formula describes the piece that's being repeated over and over again as we go around this um, ring. Here is our example of acetic acid. We can see this structural formula here. And, uh, and that is going to be the component in just distilled white vinegar.
So isomers. It may be possible for the same atoms to be rearranged in different ways. Uh, isomers, compounds with the same chemical formula, but different molecular structures. Um, and so an example that we're going to use is going to be acetic acid and methylformane. They both have two carbons, four hydrogens, and two oxygens, but they're arranged differently. So let's take a look at that. Here we can see acetic acid. We have this central carbon here, three hydrogens on it. That's bound to a carbon. Here we have the central carbon, three atoms around it, but that's instead bounded to this oxygen right here, which is then bound to this carbon. Um, so even though they contain the same kind of atoms in both, they are structurally arranged differently. They're going to have very different properties because of that. Spatial isomers. So this one's a little tricky. Um, in this case, we have the same kind of atoms. They are actually, for the most part, um, arranged exactly the same way, except for what they are is they're actually mirror images of this. This You could think of this like how your left hand is very similar to your right hand, but they're not superimposable. They're not the same thing. Your left glove doesn't fit on your right hand. Um, and what winds up happening when you turn them back around is if you pay attention right here, we have this hydrogen that's sticking up towards us, where in this example, that hydrogen is actually um, sticking towards the back. And even though this is a subtle difference, it can actually lead to some pretty uh, substantial uh, differences in properties. A lot of medicines and things of that nature uh, have these properties, and sometimes they can be very medicinal, and other times they cannot. One famous example was with a drug called thalidomide. It had a property like this. It had both an S form and an R form. The S form was found to be helpful to women when they were pregnant to avoid morning sickness. And, um, but when they went to distribute it in order to save costs, they left the R form in there as well. And it turned out that the R form actually led to, um, birth defects. Uh, so it's very important to recognize these sorts of things and, um, always be very careful with any kind of product that you use, uh, in order to figure out, you know, whether or not it's safe. Section 2.5, Learning Objectives. We're going to state the periodic law and explain the organization of the elements in the periodic table. Um, we'll see that you can predict some general properties of elements based on this. And we're going to talk about the difference between metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. So, the, this, the periodic table was discovered by Dmitry Mendeleev and uh, Lothar Meyer. Basically, what they were doing is they were just looking at elements as they went in higher and higher masses. And they noticed that every once in a while, there seemed to be a pattern that was repeating. So, you know, lithium and sodium have very different masses, um, but they have similar properties. And they just kept going along and noticing that there's like this repeating pattern in the properties of different um, elements. They both published their tables um, in, in according to increasing atomic mass. And Mendeleev was actually able to use his table to predict the existence of uh, some elements that had not been discovered yet. And when they were later discovered, um, this provided a lot of support for Mendeleev's ideas, that there was something to this sort of curiosity. Here we can see Mendeleev's original table looks very different than the one that we know today. And anecdotally, Mendeleev great beard. <laughs>
as we move on, we get to the modern uh, periodic table. And one of the big differences is that we started to move away from mass because we started to realize that the relationships really involve the atomic numbers and that we should be arranging the periodic table according to this instead. instead. Um, and so our modern periodic table arranges the elements increasing order of atomic numbers and it groups um, elements of similar properties into uh, the columns or I mean the yeah vertically the vertical columns in the table so we can see that we have group one group two group three all of the elements in group 1 are going to have similar properties, just like all of the elements in group 18 are going to have similar properties. Um, and there is some additional level of organization that we have here as far as these guys are our metals, these guys are our metalloids, and these guys are our metals, or our non-metals over here. So what are those? Metals are shiny, malleable. They're good conductors of heat and electricity. Non-metals appear dull. They're poor conductors of heat and electricity. And metalloids have properties somewhere in between. They conduct heat and electricity moderately well, and they possess some properties of metals and some properties of non-metals. So we have some classifications that we use. So we have our main group elements. These are uh, elements that are in group 1, 2, 13 through 18. Then you have your transition metals. You're going to find these in groups 3 through 13. And then we have our inner transition metals. These are the two rows at the bottom of the periodic table, the lanthanides and the actinides. We have some additional names for some of the groups. The first group, for instance, excluding hydrogens, are called the alkali metals. Group 2 are called the alkaline earth metals. Group 15 are the nictogens. The group 16s are the chalcogens. Group 17 are the halogens. And group 18 are what we call the noble or inert gases. Here we can see a visual representation of that. So we have our transition metals, alkaline earth metals, nictogens, chalcogens, halogens, noble gases, and down here at the bottom we have the lanthanide and the actinide series. In section 2.6, we're going to define ionic and molecular covalent compounds. We're going to predict the type of compound form from elements based on their location within the periodic table, and we'll determine formulas for some simple ionic compounds. So we've seen that in ordinary chemical reactions, the nucleus of each atom, and thus the identity of the element, remains unchanged. So electrons participate in chemical reactions, not protons. Oh, um, and that these different reactions are going to happen through the gain or loss of electrons to form ions. If we picture this, we have a sodium atom here. It has 11 electrons. When we remove one, it actually gets smaller. The radius decreases. We get 10 electrons, and it winds up getting this positive charge here because it's lost that negative electron. So the periodic table can help you with predicting the ionic charge that you should expect for the main group elements. Um, many main group elements lose enough electrons to leave them with the same number of electrons as an atom of the preceding noble gas. So group 1 loses 1 electron, it has a plus 1 charge. Group 2 is going to lose 2 electrons, it's going to have a plus 2 charge. On the other side of the periodic table, um, they're going to want to start to gain electrons. 17 will gain 1. Group 16 is going to gain 2. Um, and so let's look at some examples of that. We have calcium here that's in group 2. We'll expect that it's going to lose 2 electrons, and it's going to have a plus 2 charge. Um, bromine is in group 17. 
we're going to expect that it gains an electron and it now has a negative one charge. Um, so moving from the far left to the far right in the periodic table, positive charges of cations are equal to the group number. Moving from the far right to the far left in the periodic table, negative charges of anions are equal to the number of groups moved to the left of the noble gases. Um, that doesn't really work for transition metals because they actually can have multiple different charge forms. So let's picture this a little bit. It's a lot easier with it all laid out here. So basically in group one, right, lithium wants to be like helium. So it's going to lose one electron so that it would have the same number of electrons as helium. Similarly, sodium wants to lose one so that it can be like neon, all right? Over here though, oxygen, it wants to gain two electrons to be like neon. Chlorine wants to gain one electron to be like argon and so on and so forth. So we get this definite pattern here to how these are gonna happen. And then the transition metals are just pretty much unpredictable. We really don't know what kind of charges we're gonna find on those guys. So, so far the ions that we've discussed have been monoatomic ions. They only um, involve one uh, um, atom. However, there are polyatomic ions. These are going to be like electrically charged little groups of atoms, and they're going to tend to never really break up. They're always going to be kind of together um, and moving like a little group, almost as if they were just a single atom. When you're kind of arranging things, here are some common polyatomics. This table is available here and in the book, and this is going to come up. We're going to be working with these as we go through uh, the class, and it's important to start to recognize them when you see them inside of molecular formulas. Let's look at some stuff. There's a system for naming the oxyion anions, um, polyatomics that contain oxygen. When a metal, when a non-metal forms two oxyions, anions, eight is the suffix used for the ion with the larger number of oxygens. I is the suffix used for the ion with the smaller number of oxygens. When a non-metal forms more than two oxyions, prefixes are used to eight and eight. So you're going to have per eight, 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 and then hypo eight. So an example of this would be like uh, there is per chlorate, then there's a chlorate, then there's chlorite, then there's hypochlorite. All right, so covalent versus ionic bonds. So when electrons are transferred, ions form, and an ionic bond can result. These are electrostatic forces. They're pretty powerful bonds that um, hold the uh, atoms together. However, when electrons are shared between the two atoms, a covalent bond results. We, com we classify compounds according to what kind of bond they have, whether they have an ionic or molecular bond. So, metals readily lose electrons. We saw that before in, um, when we were trying to predict the uh, ions that we would see in the periodic table. Nonmetals readily gain electrons. When a metal and a nonmetal react, the electrons are transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. Okay, so that electron really wants to be with the non-metal 
more than it ever did with the metal. So metals and nonmetals generally form ionic bonds. And there are and so the compounds that are made from metals and nonmetals are called ionic compounds. Here's an example. We have sodium chloride. When we have one sodium atom, it gives up an electron. Chlorine readily accepts this electron, and we get the ionic compound NaCl, or normal table salt. We can do the same thing with calcium, only calcium is going to give up two electrons. So we're going to need two chlorine atoms to accept one electron for each one. And we get this uh, ionic compound calcium chloride, CaCl2 in this case. So what are some properties of ionic compounds? They're typically solids. They typically have a really high melting point or a boiling point. They're not conductive when they're solids, but when you melt them down and you free up those ions, they're now able to conduct electricity. Um, this has been used pretty extensively in industries for various different purposes. Some of the very first um, fuel cells were based on molten salt. Um, ionic compounds do not have a charge themselves. Overall, they are neutral. And what we do is we use this to determine what the ratios between them should be. So if we look at our example down here, we have aluminum with a plus 3, and we have oxygen with a negative 2. If one oxygen came over here and bound to this aluminum, it would still have a plus one charge, and it wouldn't it wouldn't be a neutral species. Okay. Similarly, if we just took two oxygens and put it over here, well then I would have plus three and a negative four. It would have a negative charge. So what we need to do is find the least common multiple between these two. So what we're going to have to do is have two aluminums for a plus six charge here. And we're going to have to have three oxygens for a negative six charge here to ultimately yield our neutral aluminum oxide. So a lot of times, um, rather than individual monoatomic ions, we're going to have polyatomic ions that we're going to be working at. With. As we talked about before, the polyatomics are going to be treated as discrete units, um, and typically they're stuck inside a parenthesis in a formula to indicate that they are a group of atoms that behave as one unit. Our example here, we have calcium phosphate. Calcium is a plus two. We're going to need three of those in order to give us a plus six. We're going to counterbalance that with two phosphate um, polyatomics uh, to give us a minus six so that we get our neutral species. And we're going to put these parentheses around the phosphates to indicate that those are all working together as one unit. Covalent compounds. Molecular compounds or covalent compounds result when atoms are shared. They exist as discrete neutral molecules. Um, they're usually formed by a combination of nonmetals. Uh, they're often are gases or liquids that are going to boil really easily or um, at least low melting point solids. All right, so in 2.7, we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to name our ionic and covalent compounds. All right, so what is nomenclature? Nomenclature is a collection of rules for naming things. Um, compounds can be identified by both their formula and their name. This is important these days, um, you know, with all the typing and stuff like that. Um, you can't really put in all those subscripts and stuff and expect that any old person off the street is going to be able to read and understand that. Um, so we're going to have to learn how to name um, both ionic and molecular binary compounds composed of two elements. 
and we're going to talk about ionic compounds containing polyatomic ions. Okay, when we're naming ionic compounds, we want to name the cation first, followed by the name of the anion. Um, a monoatomic cation, so we only have one atom here, is just given the name of the element. A monoatomic anion is given the name of the element with its ending replaced with the suffix "-ide". A polyatomic ion is just given the name of the ion. So let's look at some examples. Here we have sodium and chlorine coming together to form a compound, and we call it sodium chloride instead of chlorine. Here we have potassium and bromine. Called potassium bromide in this case. Um, he, similarly, over here we have calcium and we have phosphate. Calcium phosphide. All right. Now, when we're doing polyatomics, all right. Here we have the ammonium uh, polyatomic, so we call this ammonium, and we still change the last part chloride when it comes afterwards but up here you'll notice that when we have the acetate polyatomic bound to potassium we call it potassium acetate we don't change this to acetide when the polyatomic is the anion Uh, so most of the transition metals and some main group metals can form two or more cations with different charges. The charge of the metal ion is specified by the Roman numerals. So we need to be a little bit more specific when we're talking about the transition metals. So because iron can either be a plus two or a plus three, we need to, when we're writing out the name, give it um, these little Roman numerals to tell us what the charge is. So we know that this iron has a plus two charge when we say iron two chloride, and this iron has a plus three charge when we call it iron three chloride. Hydrates. So a lot of times different compounds are gonna have one or more water molecules associated with them. Um, when that's not true, they're called anhydrous compounds, and we just name them like we just saw. But when it is true, we're going to add the word hydrate at the end, but we need to add the proper Greek prefix for denoting the number of water molecules. We're going to talk about what those prefixes are at the very end. But here are a couple of formulas for you here. We have copper to sulfate, this guy right here. We write a little dot. We see that it, there are five water molecules associated with it. So that is penta, meaning five, hydrate. Down here, we have our calcium chloride. Get our little dot. There's one water molecule here. We're going to call this calcium chloride monohydrate. So molecular compounds are named using um, a slightly different set of rules. Um, basically, there are a lot of different combinations. So we're going to give pretty much all of the um, atoms participate or all the names for the atoms participating in a Greek prefix. And we're typically going to start with the more metallic element, the one furthest to the left or to the bottom of the periodic table. Um, sometimes there's a little discrepancy about which one should be the right one. And you'll actually see things written just a little bit differently um, on those edge cases. So try not to get too caught up on that. Um, and then we're going to have the Greek numbers. Uh, are designated for each one of the prefixes. Um, and we're typically not going to use mono. So if there's only one thing there, we're going to skip over it. Um, so, and when there's two vowels are adjacent, so like basically when the word looks a little weird because you have too many vowels running together, you're going to drop the A from the Greek prefix. Uh, 
the Greek prefix that we're going to use here. Um, there for one, there's mono, two, die, three, try, four, tetra, five, penta, six, hexa, seven, hepta, eight, octa, nine, nana, ten, deca. Um, it's a little complicated to get into this video, all of the different ways that we're going to name covalent compounds. Um, but there are a lot of really great examples in the homework this week and in my homework guide that I'd like for all of you guys to look at. Um, thank you very much for your time. You guys have a wonderful day.